welcome everyone to the RVS Bottom Line Studio <laughs> once again. And today we have Carlos Jonas in the studio. Welcome, Carlos. Thanks for having me. <laughs> and today we will talk about the topic of design thinking. And Carlos, I want you to first of all introduce yourself. Yeah, that's a good starting point. So, um, yeah. Um, I'm a facilitator and, and a trainer and um, work particularly with this methodology which you just uh, named design thinking. So uh, when, uh, when, uh, when, I, when people ask what I do, so I like to phrase it in a way that I help companies uh, define and validate their, their ideas early on. And uh, to my mind, the design thinking methodology which we're going to be talking about today is uh, one great approach. And um, one thing particularly I do is design sprints, uh, which is, uh, I would call, a framework that derives out of uh, design thinking, uh, where you basically put the team, uh, book f whole week uh, to define and validate uh, ideas to their uh, current challenges they are having in their, their team. So, uh, yeah, that, that, that's one part of the coin. So, mm -hmm. the, like, facilitating ideation, validating ideas and the other part actually doing trainings on that same topic like uh, working with organizations, doing training on design thinking, uh, where we do the hands-on actually solving things because to my mind design thinking is an approach that you cannot like learn in a seminar when uh, where I tell you what is design thinking, you have to experience it yourself to understand it. Mm -hmm. So that's in short, so facilitator and trainer of design thinking. Let's put it this way. <laughs> and uh, we'll get into that more in depth uh, as we go on. But what was, let's say, it sounds like a really specific career path that you chose, but how did you get there? Like, what was your career before that? What yeah. did it look like then? I think it's really hard to say that I chose this <laughs> this path. Like, it's basically, this is where, where I'm currently am. Well, what I just described before is where I have ended up in a way. At least that's how I like to phrase it because it all started out actually uh, as well uh, while studying, studying here, uh, like at RBS, the bachelor studies. And um, yeah, and I was offered a job at one, uh, one, uh, one we can call it, uh, user experience design agency, where I was working as a user experience um, consultant, uh, project manager. And that's where I kind of, <laughs> for the first time, met design thinking and kind of fell in love with, with it in a way. And um, that allowed me to kind of, yeah, explore the path. Actually, uh, I used the bachelor uh, like thesis as well uh, to explore the topic of design thinking. So that was quite an amazing experience. And, and afterwards, uh, yeah, I'll like uh, uh, it just kind of, yeah, follow, fo followed through things. So, uh, while working as a, as a consultant, one really important thing I understood is that one thing is to design things, but uh, a really important part is to understand what do you want to design uh, and what do you want to create and whether that's something you want to pursue. And the, I, to my mind, that's a, a challenge for all of us, not only in the business world, but even in the personal world, uh, where when we are thinking of what we want to do, uh, we kind of have these big, big games, big goals, yet uh, there are ways how we can validate whether that direction is, uh, is good enough uh, rather than deciding, oh, I'm going to study this and going to become a psychologist, for example, but instead uh, maybe trying talking with a psychologist uh, and learning what he's doing to understand whether that's something I'd be interested in. You see, you see the point? So validating these ideas and, and that's what kind of led me to kind of start uh, working on my own uh, and um, doing like these design sprints, design thinking workshops uh, with a goal to actually help teams save time on this, on uh, choosing the right direction where to put resources and time and everything. Mm -hmm. And that's like a really specific niche and you said like you, let's say, got to that point in your career from seeing how other people do it or? or Maybe I didn't catch the point, but... Um, actually, uh, you, you caught it qu quite well. So, uh, in, in my experience as well, working in uh, agencies, I uh, yeah. like, noticed that like, uh, you, you have a client who comes and says, I want this thing, uh, here's the money, you create the thing, <laughs> yeah. and that thing or, or design or, or code is not necessarily implemented and uh, therefore afterwards uh, monetized. 
So, uh, but there are means how you can, uh, by really uh, small resources and small amount of time, actually validate those things early on. And uh, to my mind, that's uh, coming up uh, with your team together, understanding what you want to do and uh, doing early, uh, early testing, early validation. Mm. And kind of uh, this type of like, like design print methodology is one thing how to do that, but obviously there are others. Okay, now I got it. Oh, and by the way, um, we actually contacted a, a person that knows you oh, personally. All right. Uh, Andre Zaber. Oh, yeah, he's a good friend of mine. <laughs> okay, and uh, like we asked him to send a quote about you. All right. <laughs> and, uh, this is what he said. Uh, okay, so it's unfortunately in Latvian. <laughs> I'll try to translate it in English as best I can. So, Carlos is a, uh, a let's say, person with his heart in the right place. Uh, he's a man... Uh, Okay, this like really, let's say, uh, philosophically said, so it's like very hard to translate it. But, okay, I'll just say it in Latvian, I guess. Vīrs kam apzinātība nav tik trandīgs vārds, bet dzīvesveids. Kārlis ir piemērs visiem, kā izstarot dzīves vieglumu un uzticēties procesam un ļauties dzīves skaistumam. Tie, kuriem ir paveicies viņu pazīt, zin, ka Kārlis cilvēcību un patiesumu uztvert ļoti nopietni, and both lielisks, draugs and biedrs. So yeah, like the, the best I would say it was in uh, Latvian, unfortunately, but uh, <laughs> a beautiful quote. By, yeah, uh, thanks, uh, thanks for sharing it. I'll definitely get back to him. Uh, who is, n n nice words. Who is he to you? Uh, he's one of my best friends, and actually, <laughs> when, uh, when, when, when people ask, like, uh, what have you got out of this school? Uh, I, my, usually my first answer is, uh, is people, those are our close friends that I have rela a good relationship, close relationship today as well. So the network, like the thing that was supposed to be the most essential part well, of it. I'd say network, that's another thing. Oh, uh, that's one thing is uh, network, obviously, mm -hmm. uh, like, uh, like many uh, uh, projects have born, uh, like uh, are born from, from these net this network that RBS has, which is, I think, amazing thing. Mm -hmm. One of the, one of the other reasons why to study here. Uh, but friends, uh, well, uh, that's some, something different. Those are people uh, with whom, as Anders uh, like mentioned, opening hearts and everything. Uh, those are the people you open hearts with. So, yeah, the, that's uh, that's what Anders says to me. Okay, awesome. And uh, I can also like relate in a way that we are like such a small community if you yeah. think about it, and everyone knows each other and it's like pretty easy to develop a connection here because I mean you work with each other with on projects yeah. every day <laughs> so I can easily imagine that like this is the place uh, where you go and to, like really build those deep connections yeah. but uh, like moving onwards what was your let's say uh, what did you do during your studies in Riga Business School? Um, Maybe like bes student union? Besides yeah, studying, besides, yeah. Besides so uh, I had the uh, opportunity to do, be part of student union for, for my uh, first year of studies. Um, uh, doing the, like, one, one of the greatest things like we did there was probably rebranding uh, the, like, student union that, that you are rebranding currently, which is amazing because I think um, brand is something that changes a long time with other people. So, that's one great thing we did uh, back in days. Uh, actually, today before we <laughs> before we started the conversation, uh, I went upstairs to check on whether the foosball table is there because actually that was a social project we did uh, together with uh, uh, with uh, with the colleagues from from our uh, um, from our course. Yeah, oh, that was from you. <laughs> not, not exactly for me. Like actually, that was class. that was from from everyone because what we did we did uh, a fundraising. Uh, among uh, RBS uh, students, among RBS alumni, and I uh, saw, so, yeah, this the table is still up there, so uh, still up there. Though you should probably ask someone to clean it. <laughs> <laughs> We're actually still making like these foosball championships to this day. Yeah, that's so, that's what I've been like following up like that, you know, that it's, <laughs> it's happening, so that that's great, it kind of like, you know, it's like a place where you can connect and uh, do some fun stuff. Mm -hmm. And how is like RBS, like uh, in retrospect, how has it changed your life, like besides the meaningful connections that you've developed? 
how has it changed like in a different way oh. your life i have a good english <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, RB is definitely um, one of the reasons um, why, but other than that, like uh, previously before we started this like uh, record, like you no, know, the live and the recording, uh, uh, we talked about like the opportunities like you were taking up here uh, as a student and uh, and the same uh, applied for, for, for me as well, uh, taking up the opportunities that um, the uh, school and it's let's say community provided uh a one good actually thing where uh, uh i don't know whether it's still taking place is uh the um, mentoring program i uh, i think yeah. uh, it, it's it still, still exists it still exists that that's amazing because that's actually like um having been connected to to a mentor actually Help me get to my my first job in a way, uh, like not exactly like at mentor's company, but uh, it allowed me to phrase okay what I'm looking for, and kind of that ignited my 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 journey where I'm currently at. So um, that's uh, one thing. Another thing is obviously the the uh, additional projects that have come out from from RBS uh, as well uh, after uh, completing it. Uh, different, uh, uh, let's say, uh, business projects, including um, seminars and workshops on, on design thinking as well, uh, with, uh, with uh, true connections that uh, we have here. And um, yeah, and in a profound way, I think, um, essentially, like, that, those were three years that I studied here and definitely uh, made a certain, uh, like, concrete aspect on, uh, of my personality, in a way, of who am I today as well. So you not only developed the knowledge, you also developed the character. Um, I think that definitely that kind of goes uh, along the way. Like even if you studied somewhere else, like in, like every experience leaves a uh, mark on your personality and kind of builds up. You know, at least that that that's my view. I'm mm -hmm. not saying that it's like uh, the only view. <laughs> wow, that's that was a really good say, explanation. And. Um, we're also like since since RBS has like these two values, leadership and technology. We're also asking questions about that. So, what does being a leader mean to you? Leader. <laughs> yes. Leader. To me, uh, actually, haven't thought about that because uh, I'm currently work like uh, working as um, like as a solo. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, like as a self-employed freelancer, uh, uh, whatever you call it these days. But essentially, for, for me, like, I think when we talk about leadership, uh, one thing, uh, a, a nice comparison comes to mind is uh, manager and leader, and, uh, and there's difference, and, uh, and uh, for, you, for, for a person to be a leader, you don't need to be a manager, or you need to have the position, so to say. Uh, to be a leader, at least for me, it means to be listening to people, uh, um, to support people uh, and uh, what else uh, being this uh, you know uh, this person to whom you will be always uh, to whom you'll be always be supported in a way uh, but by whom you're going to be supported uh, who's going to help you the like other persons uh, who are the followers uh, that uh, you as a leader are actually giving value to your to your followers and helping uh, like them grow in, in a way uh, that's what a leader to me is, and obviously uh, the vision that you obviously bring the inspiration and the vision where you, together with your followers, are going towards it. And uh, eventually that vision will be achieved and maybe you will not lo no longer be a leader for that particular group. So, yeah, going into too much detail, but I think the essential thing for leadership, for, for me at least, that's being supportive of people who you are leading. So it's like not only being the boss of you're gonna do this, <laughs> you're gonna do that. Yeah. It's also, like be leading by maybe example and by kindness, as well. Yeah, uh, I think uh, the the those... going with them. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> and uh, about technology, what are let's say some apps that you use that are maybe let's say unconventional that not a lot of people use or uncommon. Yeah. Uh, that, like still help you in your everyday life or maybe in terms of productivity or just improving your life in general I know like uh, I use this uh, um, thing called the aura app uh, 
like uh, it comes together with the like uh, a ring which tracks your sleep uh, and that kind of allows me to uh, one thing is to observe your behavior, other thing is to see data about your behavior. Uh, what it means when you uh, uh, go uh, sleep too late. What it means if you ate too much at the evening. Uh, obviously you have the feeling uh, in the next morning, uh, that's one thing. Another thing is that you have the validation by data as well. <laughs> so that would be one app uh, or app that kind of goes together with the, with the product. What does it exactly measure? Like I'm going a little bit uh, in detail, but <laughs> like what, in the, what does it measure and how can you, let's say, derive from that data that All this right. is? So uh, they have their own, like, um, let's say, um, we can call them ratings of your yes. sleep, of your mm -hmm. readiness overall, of your activity. Uh, and uh, they um, track uh, certain data that are, for example, your uh, resting heart rate, uh, when you go to sleep, obviously when you're gonna have like drunk in a glass of wine or two uh, before going to sleep, you'll definitely see, in, at least in my experience, increase in, in your resting heart rate, uh, which means that you are less rested uh, since your like, heart is beating, you know? Mm. Uh, that's, uh, that's one measure. Uh, uh, heart rate variability, uh, how like, uh, what, what is the difference between like uh, lowest and, and highest heartbeats. So, and that in the, like the higher the other thing, like that is heart rate variability, uh, like the better you're kind of also uh, physically. Uh, and there are other measures, but I think that's, that's uh, already, uh, actually <laughs> uh, like in this school, you all, we also have like um, uh, this, um, Lecturer, uh, I, who could I, I'd like to call a friend as well, uh, Davis Lucianos, who's a biohacker, and uh, he knows these stuff uh, very well. I think you should definitely invite him for <laughs> for a uh, conversation here on biohacking and and sleep because he's he's the guy. I'm just uh, and I know some things and follow just some messenger. things. Messenger, <laughs> uh, messenger, and who knows someone better. <laughs> and uh, just like moving on to a different topic, but. Describe a learning lesson or a failure that you've had in life, like a failure that changed your life in a meaningful way. Mm. All right, I think uh, actually, um, um, like when, uh, when after uh, graduating um, RBS and having uh, worked a while, like I thought, okay, uh, actually this uh, industry, like, uh, or well, let's say field of user experience, uh, which I uh, briefly touched upon before, is totally not for me. Uh, and I thought like I should be um, like totally dropping it and jumping into world of sustainability and uh, I don't know, world peace, kind of, kind of uh, just looking for, for something, you know, better. Uh, again, that depends hugely on, uh, on the individual, what is uh, what for who. But essentially, yeah. Um, um, quit the job, uh, started looking for uh, for those things. And you know, in one way you could call it failure because at the end I sort of kind of found my way back uh, in a way. I, and uh, on one hand I could look at this period and look at, oh, this is a waste of time, like uh, going to say sustainability educational camps and uh, and getting uh, like a personal coach qualification and whatnot. Uh, but at the end coming back to user experience, IT design, uh, what I essentially started uh, after graduating school. But uh, at the same point, uh, like as from one perspective, that might be a failure. There's a, uh, the other side of the coin, as I like to say, where uh, I have had like this experience on my own like uh, skin, so to say, that uh, I went through and saw, okay, uh, what are different perspectives in the world? Uh, what it means to be in different places and therefore could value uh, what I have now more because I have, uh, I wouldn't like to say like uh, um, like bigger, like wider perspective and that it's something better, but at least for me, uh, that made me uh, value uh, my previous, let's say uh, direction, which I chose to uh, better. And um, in a sense, uh, even while you live better in a way. So uh, what, what is the, like summarizing this idea is that for me, uh, getting out from uh, where I've been like kind of uh, acknowledged and getting out there in something completely new, 
uh, and getting additional knowledge that's totally unrelated and coming back to the topic where I've been like uh, been working on, like user experience, design thinking, etc. Gave me a much wider perspective, and uh, I would even call it say a, a different competitive advantage in a way as well. Nice. Because uh, I mean, user experience—if you think about it, like that is the future. So the part of user experience also should be related to sustainability. You should uh, probably also know a lot about that as well. Well, yeah, that's that's yet another topic because essentially, uh, uh, what is a value of good user experience? It's um, higher traction, and what means higher traction? That means uh, more things sold. Mm -hmm. And uh, the question is, what are we selling? Are we? What, what is the product we are building? So therefore, user experience, in a way, I think is is a tool uh, that can be used for both good and bad, uh, in a way. And uh, talking about user experience, what could be, let's say, an example that you've seen uh, of maybe a company? Uh, like doing something really well in terms of the user experience. What's something that has left you in awe, or like you're thinking this is brilliant? Like, um, like obviously, I think we've all heard like examples of Apple and Google, and uh, at this point, I can't imagine something better. But, uh, but for, from my experience, like um, I'm the person uh, that kind of uh, <laughs> I wouldn't say like trusts Google. <laughs> Because like obviously there has been there have been many scandals on on, on privacy topics, but since um, like at least in in my case my business isn't like as big and doesn't include a lot of uh, uh, physical personal like person data and everything. Like I use uh, pretty much for all for doing my business activities, I use um, like all different Google services. Uh, like starting from from email, which we I think most of us have. Uh, ending with uh, obviously documents, presentations, sheets, uh, uh, even visuals. I even tried creating a landing page there, but it uh, didn't go successfully. Calendar and everything. So it integrates so well. Like they have so many products there. But what is the one of one of the principles of uh, good user experience that among your different platforms you have different. Uh, let's say you have different products. You're, you're one company, you're one business, but you have different products that you have. Uh, a seamless experience that it doesn't matter in uh, that you use Google Docs or Google Sheets. Uh, you'll they'll be similar in a way and will be a, and you'll be able to navigate through better. So uh, I think that's uh, one great thing uh, that, that that I'm using and uh, and obviously the collaboration opportunities there, uh, inviting people, sharing the docs and everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's also probably a reason why it's so difficult. So let's say. Uh, become a, a competitor in the market because everyone's like so developed. Yeah, the, the, no, the other thing, like other hand, uh, obviously there's this, this question that's that's something uh, me and my wife have been like talking a lot um, uh, once in a while uh, that uh, we have these amazing um, companies like even uh, like um, banking app Revel, that's a really great uh, example of good user experience. Um, but uh, the question obviously is again about like ethics and sustainability. What uh, is the, let's say, um, conditions for, for the people who are working there to deliver you this good user experience? That's another thing to think about as well. Uh, uh, like uh, what are the conditions, what are the salaries, how long uh, like hours they're working to actually deliver that? Because like it's uh, quite common, uh, at least uh, that's what uh, media says, and uh, and ex employees of, let's say the big uh, uh, startup unicorns uh, that um, yeah uh, squeezing uh, uh, people out like all their like this um, you could call it um, you know you know potential, but yeah okay that's uh, <laughs> yet uh, another question essentially what I was saying that. Um, there are really great products, uh, but the other side, what we have to think about is what is the price of that uh, uh, in terms of uh, people who are building and other things, sustainability, which you mentioned as well. Mm. It's not that simple, basically. <laughs> uh, the the world simple. is not that yes. simple, I think. <laughs> so if you're thinking only about, uh, let's say, profit, then, then it's not the same. But when it's uh, talking about design, right? I want to touch about on what you're specifically specialized in. So design sprints, 
you said that it's like a, an intense week where you start with an idea or like come up with an idea. You, you start with the uh, with the challenge because the challenge. That, that's like a problem framing, uh, that's problem solving uh, framework. And uh, what are the both the purpose of uh, the the design sprints and what are the key elements of it? All right. Uh, so, uh, the, like the purpose of uh, design sprint, like you can uh, again look from, uh, from 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 the context in a way. Uh, you can uh, one th one like one of the core reasons to, to do do a design sprint is that imagine that you are building something now, uh, uh, but uh, you are not like fully certain that that's the thing we should be building. So then a design sprint, uh, like a facilitated design sprint, gives you the chance to uh, validate this idea without putting too much effort and time in it. So uh, I'd say primary, uh, let's say focus, like it also like design sprint originates from <laughs> previously mentioned Google, uh, Google Ventures. Uh, that was a methodology framed by, uh, by, by them and they used it to work with uh, their, their startups and their venture fund. And uh, essentially, yeah, uh, to validate uh, assumptions, because the worst thing we can have is build something based on assumptions that we have here, and uh, that's that goes both like in, in business and in personal life, basing some things on assumptions. Uh, and uh, obviously, design sprint day uh, week, uh, those five days won't give you uh, the answer because. Essentially, as a result, you you do like some testing sessions, but obviously not like in uh, in the scale of uh, of uh, like population of a proper research. But you just get something better than assumption. So I think that that that's a core value of uh, of a design sprint for for a theme that's building a product or starting out a project. It doesn't matter if you're a startup or or a larger business organization or a theme operating in a larger organization, but it can uh, help you validate your assumptions and. Another important aspect is kind of like a side goal that you get by having most important, like like most important stakeholders or or specialists that have a say uh, on this topic, on this idea that you're working on. Is that by getting them into a room for five days, you get uh, alignment among them, like they hear out each other, uh, like like the, the design sprint follows uh, certain uh, like let's let's call them um, uh, activities that involve, ensures that everyone in the room uh, can express themselves because that's one common thing we've seen uh, in, uh, uh, in organizations and meetings that there are people who are louder and who are more si silent and, uh, and usually uh, the ideas that are presented by those who are louder and uh, who has a say uh, will probably move forward so a design sprint kind of is a, in a bit, bit inclusive in that that uh, everyone uh, that everyone has been heard in a, in a way, and that brings that alignment in a way, and then you and uh, not only an alignment but common understanding, mm -hmm. and then when we talk about specific elements, so one thing about design sprint is that it's a, a problem solving uh, like framework. It's not like so it means that you should when you start doing design sprint you should be pretty clear on what you are kind of working on what what you want to achieve with this what you want to solve and uh because most of the time in design sprint goes towards actually working on uh, on these ideas like having uh, individual brainstorms uh, having individual concepts having uh, um, like common voting that's not like a regular presentation hey this is my concept but uh instead uh, uh having them in a different way that ensures that kind of the ideas are anonymous. Uh, and obviously I think the most imp two important parts of design sprint that can also be linked to design thinking uh, is uh, actually that's a one thing, that's experimentation. That you get, you, 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 we all have great ideas in our minds, but uh, it's really important to get them in some sort of a form. And design sprint in a way is about getting those ideas in a form in a in a form that's uh, really uh, realistic, that the people for whom this solution is being created, the customer or or I don't know a colleague or whatever, that they have they believe that it's real, like that it like the side, like the form we the prototype we are using that it's simulating how it would work in reality as well, and then engaging with this thing <coughs> with those people and 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 this 
prototype that we are building serves as a platform where we can uh, talk with the, with the people on the other side. Like we can interact with them through this prototype we are, we are building and, the, and those prototypes are, again, depends on the context. If you are uh, a SaaS company, obviously you're probably gonna be building, and, and if your pro sprint challenge is related to, <clears throat> Uh, to your uh, uh, digital product uh, and some some features and or, or user stories there, then probably you're going to be building a design prototype that you can build really in an interactive manner, where uh, it, the customer and uh, the test user might even not uh, notice that. Like okay, that depends on the fidelity, but that's yet another question. So, but the core thing there is the experimentation, and uh, that's something that connects obviously design thinking as a philosophy, and and design sprint as a particular uh, framework, problem solving framework is experimentation, getting those ideas there, expressing them, presenting them, getting feedback, and then based on that feedback, we can make more uh, more unbiased decisions that are not based only on assumptions, but on bits some qualitative uh, insights from, from customers, for example. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's also like, like um, you're not only, uh, you know, it's important to involve everyone in the process. So there's not only, let's say, a good solution to a challenge, but also everyone is up to date to what's happening, right? And you said like the product is uh, like, it's not a particular prototype that you can exactly like something intangible, mm -hmm. but what usually is like the final product after those five days? Like, is it maybe like practically a presentation or, uh, or uh, how does uh, it look uh, like? That, that really depends on context on uh, where, at what stage you are currently, what, what, what is the challenge you've come to sprint with your team in the first place? And uh, we can look at, let's say, uh, trees. So uh, let's say uh, you are starting out your business. You have, you kind of have uh, your, uh, let's say, uh, value proposition, but you are not quite uh, sure. You haven't validated that. So the end result of a sprint, if 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 your idea is to like based towards B two B customers, then that might be a pitch deck towards uh, your uh, your investors, for example, or. Uh, or if you are building a B2C solution, that might be uh, a landing page where uh, you kind of explain what your product is about and maybe you have like, a, let's say, uh, an option to leave your email or basically you have some sort of a, uh, a platform like uh, in this page, in this case, for example, landing page, mm -hmm. where, which you can show to the person and ask him what he thinks, uh, uh, how this might... Uh, serve you, uh, what this might solve for you, and you kind of get this qualitative insight. So that, that's one, 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 one approach. The other way is, of course, is about, uh, let's say we are really building the, uh, like we are focusing on certain product-related problems. So we are done with the value proposition. So we are focusing on, on let's say, uh, uh, some certain user stories, so uh, specific uh, challenges within already existing products. So uh, the, the end result would be a, a tested uh, design prototype or really simple uh, MVP. In fact, you can create really nice design prototypes using Google Slides, but that's only a remark. So uh, uh, that's one way. Obviously, Design Sprint is not only, like I've been mentioning sort of like, like digital uh, things, but actually, uh, what else can be a really nice prototype in the result, like what, where you can else do the design sprint is actually, uh, even if we talk about RBS, like RBS creating uh, like different programs, uh, uh, what we might do uh, is for example, before uh, launching a new program, actually uh, doing an experiment where we kind of do a fake launch where you can uh, like apply and that serves us as an indication that there is a, uh, like demand for it or not. Or maybe we can create, uh, let's say, an uh, open door days of a potential uh, program that we say that's gonna happen uh, and, and use that uh, open days as, uh, as a means for interacting with people and uh, asking uh, what would be important for them in this program. And then if we get like, let's say enough people applying, then we actually design it. So that's, you know, that's already starts the lean approach because 
one really important thing is about design thinking, design sprint, is that those are, are like approaches for uh, getting down those ideas, defining them, validating them, and then implementation. Uh, that's yet another story. That's where you kind of start practicing lean and and uh, and later on in the IT uh, development agile approaches. So uh, essentially, uh, where I'm working is I'm, I'm helping people define those things early on so that you don't have to change some things when you are already in the implementation process or maintenance, for example. And uh, talking about the, the design, let's say the, the sprint process itself. So you said that it's important that you find uh, a way to get everyone's, let's say, voice heard. What are, let's say, maybe some, I imagine you do this by maybe some ground rules that you set early on, like how to get that done. So what does that look like? What are maybe some rules, maybe some methods that you usually right. set to make sure uh, that everyone's heard? One, one really interesting thing is about design, well, like design sprint principles, like if you, if you read a book, like they're all there. But uh, one really nice one that you, I think uh, everyone, even those who are listening here today as well, can, uh, can take is uh, the principle of uh, working together, but alone. That you, are, you might be in the same room, you might be in the same call, you might be on the same mirror board, but rather than having a discussion, uh, you uh, write your ideas on paper or on post-its or on uh, digital post-its in Miro, for example, and afterwards have an individual walkthrough. Mm. And you don't know who, who, who wrote that idea. You just know that there's an idea. And obviously there are different methods afterwards how to examine these ideas. You can use dot voting where you kind of, where people has like uh, sticky dots and you can vote for the ideas. Oh, that, 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 that's a nice thing that's mentioned there. And afterwards, you kind of sum it all up, and uh, you might get uh, a lot done without discussing. In the sense that uh, you wanted to get ideas uh, that might solve a certain question we have. It doesn't need to be a sprint. It can be a project meeting where where the focus is on on creating ideas. And you can have a silent meeting instead. Uh, think about that, uh, because uh, although. For, for people, and in my experience doing workshops, it's really important for people to, do, to have discussion. And again, that strongly depends on, on the culture uh, uh, we, are, we are in as, as well and what, peop what type of people we are interacting with. Because there are some groups that are um, demanding discussion more uh, and, uh, and some, some groups that are okay with uh, going with uh, intense uh, silence and, and just writing. So that, again, really depends on context. And for me, as a, as a facility, that's really important to feel that, which is uh, really hard to do. Uh, not necessarily always successful there. Mm -hmm. So that sounds like a game changer to me, because, I mean, meetings usually, if there's more than, let's <laughs> say, three people involved, then some people take off the pressure of others to create the ideas. And if you get everyone to write their own and then discuss it, that's really cool. But how do you find a compromise after that? So. All people have written down their ideas. You've like posted post-it notes. Everyone has voted. How do you find like the silver lining between all those ideas? Obviously, again, that, that depends on context. Like uh, uh, with whom you're 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 doing this. Like if these are like high-level stakeholders uh, who have like their say, and uh, it's really important for them. Uh, obviously, you have a discussion afterwards. But what is really important there is that you are not discussing new ideas. You are discussing what's on paper and what's upvoted there. Uh, and you kind of have the discussion object because sometimes I think uh, in, in meetings, uh, we, what, what's a really big challenge is that uh, we don't have like a certain object. We are just throwing out ideas and, uh, and uh, an hour and a half or more could go without like, without seeing the watch, you know? Uh, but like this, for example, this approach that we just uh, talked about, like gives you an object to talk about, and that's really important. Mm -hmm. And um, like we're running out of time, but but uh, you're a, as a really a freelancer. Uh, let's say someone else is discussing to choose a similar path to yours, maybe like not exactly <laughs> as a design sprinter, <laughs> you <could> say, <laughs> but. Uh, when do you think it's a good decision to switch from working in a company to, let's say, running your own kind of company and working for yourself, by yourself? Uh, there's no good time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
I think. Uh, as long as it makes sense. Uh, when did it make sense for you? Life is gonna tell. Life told me. <laughs> like, uh, um, like I started like fully uh, uh, on my own, uh, on this, as you call it, freelancing, uh, one year ago. Uh, and uh, what was like my call in a way, which made me uh, kind of do this leap of faith, was that uh, one uh, really good. Uh, partner and I could actually say a friend of mine uh, offered uh, to participate in one project that lasted for nine months and uh, that kind of gave me the like uh, uh, I could call it like strength and willingness to actually take up the step and uh, and uh, yeah and it paid off so uh, I think uh, we kind of come back to what uh, you read before uh, Andres uh, telling about me uh, trusting the process that's something that he usually tells me, and uh, that's something, uh, yeah, we can probably tell everyone who's listening uh, this live or recording is to just trust the process, and and you'll see where you, where you end up. Because you asked me in the beginning, uh, uh, how did I choose this? Like I didn't choose this. Like it just um, it was offered as a, as an opportunity, an opportunity, and and that's. A really lucky chance that I'm um, here sitting with you doing what I'm doing well, as you call it, design sprinter. <laughs> mm, exactly, that's what makes you unique. And uh, like one last thing, uh, I have like one question, but how do you keep a work-life balance? Because I mean like as a freelancer, so the job probably never ends for you in your mind because you're probably always thinking about the next step, like what you're gonna do after that and how you're gonna, let's say, get further in life after that. So. How do you keep that life balance? Work -life uh, balance. What I'm trying to do now is taking work out of my home. <laughs> that like uh, obviously like since um, a lot of my work actually is uh, doing the actual like facilitation uh, of workshops or sprints. Uh, obviously, some of them happen online, and uh, and it's better to do them home where you have proper internet connection and uh, and and additional screen mic and everything. But uh, the other things that are related to like business operations or, or some planning or, or whatever, I try to do in a, in a co-working space, for example. It's kind of trying to split the, the, those two things. It's not necessarily it's about like it's not about splitting those two things, but just having like I think in the book Atomic Habits uh, they talk about this that uh, for each activity you should have your 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 place. Your home physical. Yeah, exactly, yeah. and I'm trying to kind of uh, because obviously, like there are there are thoughts about work and everything, and uh, you can open up your uh, like <laughs> laptop and start working at uh, late evening uh, because you have inspiration, which is an amazing thing, by the way. But I try to kind of uh, limit those things that okay, I work there, and that uh, home is only for 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 me and my wife, you know. <laughs> wow, yeah, what a good answer. Okay, thank you, Carlos Jonas, uh, for joining us today. And thank you, everyone, for watching. And I, I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. <laughs> so until next time, thank you for thank watching. Thank you, Dabs. Thank you, everyone. Bye.